Hello and welcome to the Situation Report, where we do our very best every week to give you the information you need to navigate an ever-changing culture. And culture is changing so fast all of the time, we need information. And that's what we're here to help you with. My name is Jeremy Stolnicker, I'm here with Chad Robichaud, and excited to bring a great guest to you today. But before we do, we want to introduce the topic. This is one that if you are a parent, uh, I'm sure that you care about. If you are the parent of a boy, uh, you should care about. If you're not either of those things, you should still care because it's so important. Still care. The, the impact on our culture of what we're about to talk about today um, is going to be profound. We're talking about raising boys in a world uh, and in a culture where men are not welcome. Raising boys in a culture where men are not welcome. And Chad, we both have sons. Uh, this is something that I think we've seen over time, uh, the value of men being lessened and, and kind of moving away from those traditional gender roles. But it seems like someone stomped on the gas and we are moving so fast away from an understanding of what it means to be a man that it's really hard to raise a boy in this culture. Yeah, I mean, like you said, we're both fathers of, of sons and and uh, we see it in our own homes as we try to, you know, raise our, you know, you raise your young son and you have your adult son now and I have two adult sons, try to raise them and steer them and guide them into, into manhood. Yeah. Uh, but it's, you know, true manhood as, as I would define it. And I think as what act manhood actually is, it has been uh, quickly becoming in contrast to culture. And, um, you know, not only we see it in our own homes, but in the program we run for veterans, Mighty Oaks Foundation, I think... I don't, we, we help so many warriors dealing with PTSD and veteran suicide issues and combat trauma. But at the core of most of those issues comes a confusion of, of uh, manhood and how men would align their lives uh, to the lives they were created to live. And, and essentially, when they come to moments of conflict and struggles, uh, they're, they're lacking the right decision-making yeah. process because they don't even understand how it is to be a man. Yep. And uh, so a lot of confusion, a lot of struggles uh, come with this uh, crazy time in our culture where, where men manhood is just not defined. Yeah, we talk so often about identity and what it means to understand your identity. All these are big terms and, and big things that we talk about. But for men growing up in our culture, you know, young men becoming men who are contributing supposedly to culture, uh, even their identity as male and what that means is so confused they can't find their identity in terms of who they are before God because they don't even know what it means to be a male this this person they were created to be and it's so challenging I want to read something as we jump into this conversation. It's from an article entitled, Another Reason Why Boys Fail by Steven Zelnick. Uh, he said this, he said, boys and young men in particular respond very well to noble purpose, but haven't had much to go on in the past 50 years of our bedraggled history. The social and cultural atmosphere has been so polluted, one wonders how young people can form life projects that demand decency and tenacious effort. Everything seems to be for sale and no one is ashamed by it. Young men are more uncertain about sex and marriage than ever. Women have been coached to take the lead and to think they need men about as much as fish need bicycles. They no longer seem to seek male protection and support. He, he ended his article this way. He said, this shift to the narratives of distrust robs men of their edge and purpose. Historically, men have been ennobled as protectors and have justified their hard work and sacrifice as heads of families and protectors of their communities. Without that aspiration, young males can aspire to be earners and consumers and lonely foragers in the sexual forest, but that is not the same thing as being men. Uh, an incredible article. This was actually called Another Reason Why Boys Fail because he wrote a, the first one, Why Boys Fail. But that's where we are. And, and the problem with that is that our culture and our society needs strong men to lead us forward. And as the father of uh, boys, I ask myself, how do I raise boys to become men in a culture where men are not welcome. Thankfully, we've got a great guest with us today to help us unpack this. Stu Breguier is with us. Stu is the head writer and host of The Glenn Beck Show, host of Stu Does America, also on the Blaze Network, radio host, producer, maybe more important for our conversation, husband and father. Stu, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Really, really appreciate it. No, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks. 
For those that don't know you, and, and most in our audience probably would, but can you give us a brief, uh, maybe your background, how you got to where you are now, and uh, you're as in the mainstream as possible, but how do you get to a place like this? How do you get here? Uh, well, I've always been a loudmouth, um, so I started with that. <laughs> Good. Uh, Good. And, you know, I think it's one of the things I, I find the world to be an interesting place. And, uh, you know, you take time to kind of sit back and look at it a little bit. You notice things uh, that interest you. And, and I've always found, found it, um, I've always loved talk radio, and, and it's sort of developed into TV and Internet and everything, you know, podcasting and everything. But it's like, it's a pretty... It's a very uh, intimate format, and it's a format right. that allows you to, to take a lot of time to sit back and think about issues. I mean, you watch some of these, you know, some of the old school sort of cable news shows. These guys come on and they say three sentences and they're yeah. off, and you know, there's a place for that for quick updates and everything. But I like what you know what you guys are doing here in, in the podcast world, where you can take a lot of time, really think about an issue, discuss it at length. And it helps people kind of understand the world, maybe make it a little bit entertaining, maybe have a little bit of perspective about what's going on every day, and then be able to bring those things into your own life. It's just something that I've always really enjoyed consuming, and yeah. it's it's a lot of fun to do as well. Yeah, it's awesome. Great. It, this, this topic that we're on today, Stu, is uh, something that's just, I'm super passionate about. and One of my, my heart just, my heart just beats for uh, making sure that men can be the men they're created to be in our culture. And uh, more and more we're seeing, as Jeremy said, the, the gas being stomped on for this movement to just change men and society and a culture and culture. And why, why do you think there's so much urgency from the left in our culture to destroy the role of men? And what's some examples that, that, you, that you've seen? Well, uh, I think it's so important because it's so foundational, right? I mean, it's such an important part of what America is. It's, you know, that, the, that nuclear family is the foundation uh, that the entire country was built on. And, you know, look, people can have different things that happen in their lives. My, my parents uh, were divorced uh, relatively early on in my life. Um, but you do see the important role of, of a father to be able to guide you uh, in, in the proper ways. And you see when it's absent what happens. Um, you know, I, as, a, as a dad myself, I have a, a son and a daughter. You know, I'm, I'm growing a little man myself. Um, right. And it's really important to me to, to make sure I'm there and try to learn, you know, teach the lessons that I have uh, learned over my life to him and, and hopefully help him grow into a man, who, you know, of honor. You know, I have a, I have a, a daughter as well who's a feisty one. Uh, she strikes me as the type of person who's going to grow up into someone who's always very able and capable of defending herself. But I stress constantly with my son, Zach, that not only, you know, the sort of schoolyard sort of stereotype where like, if someone's, you know, uh, teasing your sister, that's your job to step up and take responsibility and say that's not going to happen. And it's not only just with, you know, with a physical ability, um, you know, uh, it's also to, to go with, you know, loose talk. You know, if, I, I say to him all the time, if, if someone ever says something demeaning about your sister and she's not there, it's your job to not let that stand. Right. Because you need to be a man who's going to stand up and say, look, that's not what she's like. I love my sister. Stop saying that about her. And sometimes there's going to be repercussions for that. You might lose friends over it. You might be made fun of over it. That's okay. There's things that are a lot more important than how you feel in a moment. Yeah. But the world is, uh, I, I mean, I think it's be safe to say the world is absolutely out of control. And there are so many issues that we have to consider. Um, you and Glenn Beck and the rest of the folks there at The Blaze, you do this all day, every day, uh, breaking these things down, trying to provide context and help us to understand, you know, the perspectives we need to move forward. As a dad, though, I am constantly trying to sort through, kind of filter through all of that and say, what's really important? What do I need to care about as it relates to raising my kids? When my kids become adults and I'm no longer here to guide them, they need to know some things. Um, as you look at the, the myriad of things going on in our world, as it relates specifically to raising your kids, what are some of the things that are major concerns to you? These are the things I'm gonna deal with these issues because my kids you know, need to be able to navigate this or I need to help them through that. That's, that's such an important point you bring up because you know, I, you know, I'm, I'm not above doing uh, show after show after show after some dumb tax <laughs> policy. Uh, I, you know, I'll do that <laughs> stuff. I like diving into politics. Right. But at some point you need to realize that what you can actually control is a lot closer to you right. than that. We can talk about Washington all the time. What's in your household you can actually do something about. Um, so I look at that and I say, you know, I think one of the most important things, and I, I've been harping on this even more in sort of the COVID era, is, is how we think about education. 
Um, you know, uh, I, I've talked to a lot of uh, my friends who are generally speaking conservative, and they have a, a, a take that I think is really super valid and really uh, correct, which is we need to open up the schools. This is crazy. We're not doing this right. We need to open up the schools and get these kids back in school. There's real repercussions from this. But I keep falling back to the same thing, which is the next day, a lot of these people will do the same show, and I've done it as well, where the next day I'll say, you know what? These schools are terrible. Right, They're teaching all right. this woke nonsense. They're not f fun of, uh, f uh, f like focusing on foundational right. values. They're doing none of these things. I can't believe how bad the schools have become. <laughs> well, if they're terrible, why are we so excited about getting them open? Yes. Now, I do, I do realize that that is a really crucial thing. Um, but like, you know, we were, you know, one of the things I, I focused on many uh, years ago uh, when we uh, our kids were going into school, we had that choice as to whether to send our kids to public or private school. Now, we've been fortunate enough to have the means to do that, and not everybody does. But uh, when I first did it, I remember thinking to myself, you know, here is, this is a lot of money. I could have this for free. I'm already paying taxes essentially for it. Why am I going to add extra money on top of that? And I thought to myself, you know what? We'll get them a few years of foundation early on. And if, if something changes with the job or whatever, we'll just pull them out and put them in, in public school. Right. I've totally flip flopped on this yeah. now. <laughs> I have, it is the best money I spend every single year without question. And I will be under a bridge sending them to the school <laughs> before I change that yeah. policy. Yeah. Um, and I think conservatives can really, I think, go a long way as to not just saying, like, open up the schools, which is definitely part of this, but also in addition of, of thinking of ways uh, that conservatives can be involved to get kids the ability, maybe the, if you, they don't have the means, um, to get the ability to send more kids to, pub, to private school, more kids to these pods that have developed in COVID, um, more, uh, inst more institutional learning outside of the institutions. Right. I think that's fundamentally really important and can help shape the future. I wanted to take a minute to let our audience know about the work that we do through an incredible veterans nonprofit called the Mighty Oaks Foundation. Many of our nation's warriors struggle with the hardships of military service and reintegration back into civilian life. Often they leave broken homes in their aftermath and comprise one of the most at-risk groups for suicide, with over 20 veterans who take their lives every single day. Mighty Oaks tackles this critical issue with our faith-based peer-to-peer resiliency and recovery programs offered at no cost to our honored servicemen and women at beautiful ranches across the United States. Mighty Oaks has one of the highest success rates of any program available anywhere. Visit MightyOaksPrograms.org to learn more about how you can make a direct impact in the lives of our servicemen and women to help them find a new life purpose through hope in Christ. Again, that's MightyOaksPrograms.org. Witnessing the transformation that these men and women go through is absolutely incredible. There are no words to describe seeing warriors restored to the lives they were created to live, changing their legacies for eternity. Your support is needed now more than ever and will ensure that our programs are here for our warriors who are in desperate need. Again, the website is MightyOaksPrograms.org. Yeah. Do you think... Uh do you think that COVID and taking kids out of schools has put the responsibility for that back in the lap of parents? I think a lot of parents, it's just on cruise control all the time. Now they're thinking about these things. Now they're looking at schools and school boards and teachers that don't want to teach. I see this, it can be a negative, but, but if we will wake up to what's happening and we've had it exposed to us, it really could be a positive for us. Do you think that's going to happen or are we gonna get back to, we don't care anymore? You know, I really hope so. I think, you know, this has opened up a, a lot of uh, opportunity um, for parents. Uh, I think you have to kind of separate from the, you know, a, look, a global pandemic sucks. It, it's right. ruined all of our lives for a year in so many ways. Uh, so it's hard to sometimes see the positives there. But I mean, I've, we've talked to tons of parents who have just said, look, you know, I never really looked at my kid's curriculum, but now they're on Zoom in front of me every yeah. day, and I'm horrified as to what I'm seeing. Yeah. Um, but I, th I think as well, there is that, there, there needs to be more involvement from the parent, um, but there are bigger long-term solutions. You know, when you talk about politics, there's this sort of axiom that goes, uh, you know, never let a crisis go to waste right. from Rahm Emanuel back in the day. And, you know, <laughs> the right. way he was implementing it, I do not endorse. However, <laughs> uh, I will say it's a good, it's sometimes an interesting way of thinking about it. Here's a, here's a, a set of views that conservatives have, have advocated for a really long time, saying like, hey, 
the government teaching your kids is not the ideal solution. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe school choice, uh, maybe school vouchers. There's a lot of different things uh, going on that the conservatives have been pitching for a long time. Right. Here's the ultimate opportunity. Kids right. are, 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 parents are incredibly frustrated at their schools right now, yeah. rightfully so. It's costing their kids all sorts of development and learning and all of these experiences. Yet at the same time, I'll tell you, my school, my kids were back at school on August 13th yeah. and have not been out of school for one day because of, uh, of COVID, at least in this school year. I mean, what is it, what situation is that creating? Yeah. You're creating two Americas where, you know, California and, and, and New York kids are having an entirely um, inferior experience to Florida and Texas kids. Sure. That is not a development that's going to play out well in the long term. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. What, uh, you know, I, I have two two boys as well. Uh, they're grown now, and I I just remember I grew up in the South. I grew up in Louisiana. I grew up learning how to work hard, respect women. Like manhood for me growing up was very clear. And then you know my, my boys, I think I raised them really well to be men. They're both Marines and uh, mm -hmm. serving. So they're adult. They're adults now. And I, but I look back. You know, when you get to this point, kind of new empty nester. I get to this point to where I'm looking back and saying, I think I taught them really well how to be men, but I didn't really teach them well of what they would encounter in the world, what other views were out there, the landscape. Because I, I had no idea we'd be where we are today in the landscape that we are today in the abstract uh, uh, thoughts of manhood. And what's some things that, you know, Zach's a little bit younger than my kids. What's some things that you're doing to help with prepare your son to enter into the world and know the world's going to be you know, this this concept of manhood is just so abstract, so different. I think the main thing is hopefully not screwing it up too badly. I think, you know, at, this, at, this, at this day, I'm just like, hope when I have them for alone for a couple of days, I'm, I'm really glad when they're still alive at the end of it. The major goal uh, of all parents are hurdles yes. as a dad. Um, no, I think you're right. I mean, I, I worry about this same thing because, as I said, you know, like, you know, like everything in Texas, I, I love it here. You know, I grew up in the Northeast. I'm not a Texas guy from birth, but I'm. Um, you know, I got here as fast as I could, as they say, and I don't want to leave. I, I love it here. And, and at some at some level, there is a little bit of a bubble situation, I think, that goes on here. You know, we have them in a very good school. Uh, we have them in, you know, church, and we, we try to, you know, faith is really important. It's a Christian school that we go to, and they're immersed in that much more than I was as a kid. My, kid, my parents were religious. We went to school on Sundays. I always, you know, felt they did a good job trying to teach me those principles. But, like, my kids are immersed in it. I mean, every Every day they're taking Bible every single day um, it's a different world and I think at times you know I have thought to myself do I want to keep them in this bubble or do I want to try to expose them to a lot of these things generally speaking I've favored the bubble yeah um, largely because I think there's always going to be time for them to be tortured by liberals and their terrible <laughs> ideas and I would like to uh, push that into the future as much as possible but it is important I think to get to them and 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 open up uh, to all sorts of views. I'm a, I'm a big uh, believer in more speech, not less. I don't believe in you know censoring, and, and I, I want them to consider these um, viewpoints themselves and be able to make their own um, uh, decisions on them, and without fail, they will take roads that I don't appreciate or don't want them to take. But on the other side of that, if you can just try to do your best to institute those those foundational principles early on, or it's second nature. You know, my kids like to, you know, my, my son just, you know, is playing baseball right now. He's, he's a good player. And, you know, he started early playing baseball, and his swing is just natural, right? It's just a great natural swing. He has an ease fielding the ball and throwing the ball. Yeah. And, and you can tell that he's been doing it for a while. Even with other kids that, you know, might excel at other sports, you can tell that he's got that foundation already. It's the, a lot of the basics of baseball are easy for him. And that is a huge advantage. Yeah. He might not grow up to be a major leaguer. He might not grow up to play in college. But he'll always have the ability to throw the ball around and be comfortable. So the same thing happens, I think, in life, right, where you have those foundational principles. Like, you know, people stray from God. They stray from their principles all throughout life. But if that's, that little voice is there in the back of your mind saying, eh, maybe you should instead do the right thing here, I think as a parent, that's all you can really do. Yeah. Yeah, and I've really enjoyed, I mean, it's one of the greatest joys of being a parent of adult kids is watching those biblical principles that I raised them with play out in their, yeah, in their adult true. life when they're making their own decisions. It's really been, been a, a fun phase for my, a, a stressful phase, but a, a fun phase. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can kind of sit back and say, hey, I, I think I did a decent job here. Uh, <laughs> that's great. Now we can celebrate. 
I didn't think I would. I didn't think I knew what I was doing, but maybe it worked out. Maybe it worked out. <laughs> we uh, one of the the conversations around gender roles and uh, even the transgender movement and those kind of things is compassion and we talk about how we need to be compassionate and and a lot of people have taken the compassion route and that means they've taken their hands off of this entirely they've said well we're just going to let it work out we'll let it play out we want to be kind we want to be accepting we want to let things happen um, but we know that gender roles have become a major battleground in in the culture war it's it's it, it may be the battle uh, the the uh, battle in the on the battleground uh, you know what I meant there. <laughs> sure. this, is, this is the war, right? Is for gender roles and what that plays out to be and what that looks like. And I think the reason many people just allow that to happen and allow it to go and they say, well, things are different now than they used to is because they don't really understand what's at stake. Uh, what's at stake if we cannot raise young boys to be men that can navigate the future? What do we lose? What happens? It's a great question, and I think, uh, well, we're going to find out is probably the correct answer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, you know, it's funny because we're told by the media, by the left, by this sort of uh, the the activists in this area that gender is basically the most important thing, um, and then we're also told it's the least important right. thing. Right? <laughs> it like matter. men and yeah. women don't make any difference at all. Right. But also, you have to get the right pronouns every time you talk to someone because it's so vitally important to their personal well-being. Yeah. Um, you know, I think we've come to this point where we're treating gender as sort of like y your name, right? Like, we can all say, okay, his name was Lou Alcindor, and then he changed his name to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And I think out of our, our, our under natural reaction is to say, well, look, I mean, if he wants to be called Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, that's sure. fine. Yeah. Well, he's now Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, we're all going to embrace that. That's totally fine. That's not how gender works, right, though. Right, you don't just right. get to say it one day. Yeah. It's, you know, I mean, I, I like, the left seems to be constructing this idea of gender, and I, I remember Ellen DeGeneres explaining this way. She said that gender is just a feeling you have in your mind. Hmm. Well, that might be valid <laughs> to discuss, like, what feelings you right. have in your mind. I'm not saying that there's no value in discussing that, but it's not gender. That's it's right. not what it is. You know, gender is something that is, you know, a, a it has inherent characteristics. You see this all the time. I mean, you know, I, I have not, I'm not the type of uh, parent that like, you know, and there's nothing, you know, parents make their own decisions on this. But like, we've tried to keep my son away from like, you know, more violent video games and, and violent fare. Um, just because I, I feel like he's going to get into that. I know I got into it eventually. He's going to get into it eventually. I don't mind him having as innocent as a childhood as he possibly sure. can. But he is drawn to it. Like inherently, he loves watching the fighting videos. He loves watching the brutal hits in the NFL. He he's drawn to it at some level yeah. because you know he's a boy. And we if we don't recognize those differences and understand them, um, we are putting ourselves at a disadvantage. I always think of the founders when they uh, designed this system of government. One of the brilliant things they did was understand human fallibility. They didn't try to say, well, we'll just make everyone perfect. Right. They said, no, people are going to react, let's say, in, in, a, in a way that's, uh, that emphasizes self-interest. So let's design a system where self-interest can get us to good outcomes. Yeah. That's capitalism, right? Yeah. Um, and it's worked really, really well for a couple of hundred years, despite everyone's uh, attempt lately to derail it. And I think, like, you know, th this sort of nuclear family thing has been pretty good right. for humanity. Right. We've come a long way with it. I just don't think it should be abandoned. And I don't know what the, the end game is here. This has moved faster than I think anybody has, has yeah. seen coming. I think, I think the rate of which this is transition has been the shocking thing for me and for everyone. Yeah, and hopefully as we talk more about it and educate folks, we can make a difference. Again, as you mentioned earlier, we need to control what we can control. And I think what we can control as parents is our home, to teach our kids, to help them to understand it, not as dogma, but the truth behind it and the science behind it, if there's science and why this makes sense, and then to carry that forward. Um, man, appreciate, yeah, I, appreciate I, the conversation, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thanks so much. I mean, I think it's just so important. You make a great point there. Like, you know, conservatives are, are fundamentally are supposed to look at smaller government, right? We spend a lot of time talking about the big federal government policies, which are, of course, important to, to follow up on. But, you know, you, you know, the smallest issue of government, essentially, is your family. And be, uh, thinking about it in those terms and thinking about the policies you're implementing with your family are a hell of a lot more important than the ones that they're, they're doing in Washington. That's right. And we spend a lot of time distracted on that. 
uh, we could, I think we could all do better, including myself, on, on focusing on you know where the real difference can be made. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Stu, where can people follow you and, and watch your show and uh, your show with Glenn and you know whatever else you want to point them to? Well, as you mentioned, we're on Blaze TV. I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to talk to us. Uh, you know, I'm at Stu Does America is the name of my my stupid little show. Uh, it airs every single night at 8 p.m. Eastern on Blaze TV, so you can get me on all the social at Stu Does America or any time on Blaze TV and, of course, the, the Glenn Beck radio shows and, I don't know, a zillion stations across America. Yeah, Stu, thank you so much. I know you're very, very busy. Appreciate you dropping in and taking some time to help us figure this out. Yeah, thanks for yeah. taking the time. I appreciate it. It was a great conversation. Yes, sir. Yeah, you guys keep pushing the truth out there. <laughs> we'll do it. We'll try. <laughs> thanks, guys. This is such a critical issue, and I appreciate Stu's insight. Uh, there is something about being a parent that causes you to think about things like this much more critically, much more carefully, and in a much more focused manner. And uh, I so appreciate he, he is tremendous at breaking down the politics of the day. If you watch his show, uh, you know that. If you haven't, you need to. But when it comes to this issue, it becomes personal when it's our own kids. And I appreciate uh, his perspective on that. Said so many wonderful things. I want to give you today's situation report. These are the major takeaways from the conversation. Uh, number one, the role of men is critical in order for a culture to move Move forward in a positive way. Uh, the traditional roles of men and women, the traditional, as we talked about, nuclear family, uh, this is the way, this is the foundation upon which our founders established what would become the United States of America. This is the way it was des designed and intended to work. And when you take that away, things change not for the better. Uh, this is critical. Men must understand what it is to be men. That leads us to the second thing though, and that one probably was no surprise, but here's the second thing. Uh, you heard this in our conversation. We must control what we can control. We have to control what we can control. In our world, there are a thousand different issues uh, happening all of the time. Let's figure out what we can control, what we can impact, and let's impact that. And perhaps the best way to do that in, in the context of what we're talking about today is by impacting those in our home, by helping our children know uh, what they were created to be and what they were created to do and how they can move forward, to raise those kids in a way they can navigate whatever happens to be out in front of them. And then we had a great conversation conversation about education, and uh, man, this is so critical. We take our kids perhaps to church on Sunday, we spend some time with them during the week at home, but then we send them off for a countless number of hours in an education system that does not agree with our perspective and our view on the world and culture. We need to get that back. We need to control the education of our kids and grow them again into adults that know how to navigate the future as it unfolds in front of them. What a wonderful conversation, and uh, I hope that you gained some things from that. Look forward to talking to you next time on the Situation Report.